guys, welcome to our second recap session for biology and bioenergetics. So today we're going to be looking at your required practical um, for rates of photosynthesis and looking at the limiting factors of photosynthesis. So by the end of this lesson, you should be able to describe how temperature, carbon dioxide and light all affect the rate of photosynthesis and can become limiting factors to the rate of photosynthesis in plants. So quick quiz for you, six questions and these test your prior knowledge, shouldn't be too much trouble, but always refer to your revision guide if you need a little bit of help. So this is um, prior learning that you'll need and this will help you with the lesson that we're on now. So pause this video and do these in your book for me and then come back to go through these together. Okay, so we talked about um, all of these in the last lesson um, in this series. So the first one was on photosynthesis and chloroplast. So this is the second lesson and all of these were mentioned in the first. So palisade cells are near to the surface of leaves and that allows them to absorb the most light possible because the light doesn't have to travel through the leaf before it gets in absorbed. The surface of leaves is usually darker than the underneath because there is more chloroplasts or there are more chloroplasts in the palisade cells which are at the top surface of the leaves. Carbon dioxide enters the leaves through the pores in the underside of the leaf. Um, they are known as stomata and that is also how oxygen leaves or diffuses out of the leaf. Um, air circulation within the leaf is really important for the exchange of gases, so um, carbon dioxide diffusing in, oxygen diffusing out and also water vapour being um, lost through the leaves in transpiration. And plants need to be able to close their stomata when they're not photosynthesizing, usually overnight, and that helps them to conserve water. So I hope they were all okay. Let's move on to today. So some amazing living structures. Um, plants can be immensely huge. Um, this is a Canadian redwood and you can see um, with the, the lad in the picture that the tree is huge behind him and this is all down to the sugars that the tree is able to produce in photosynthesis. Um, another example, a tree that you can drive your car through, um, and this is quite nice. This is a bloom of algae off the coast that you can clearly see for miles because it is so vast. So these um, blooms happen when the temperature um, and light conditions are optimum, so at their best, and it causes these huge blooms of algae to, um, to be produced. Um, and these are obviously very important for certain uh, other organisms that eat the algae, they feed off the algae, so you get lots of fish following the blooms around because they happen on an annual basis. OK, so thinking about photosynthesis, um, photosynthesis obviously is uh, the process that plants use to uh, synthesise their own food and doing so provides them with a source of energy to um, produce more cells to grow, get bigger. And that's in exactly the same way as we do by replicating our cells through mitosis, creating more copies of identical cells. And that allows for both growth and repair. Obviously plants synthesize their own food, whereas we actually consume food, but the, the, um, the process is the same for growth. And there's an example of an oak sapling and then um, an oak tree after many years, I expect, um, of, of growth and photosynthesis. So the links that you can see in this lesson are all available. You'll have to type them into your browser or search for them because I don't think that Loom will allow you to click straight through to them. So I apologise for that. 
Um, but as this is going on YouTube only, you'll just have to type them in. So if you pause and then type them in and then you can come back to the lesson. OK. So the required practical is all about measuring the rates of photosynthesis. And we can do that in a number of ways. So an indirect method would be to measure changes in biomass because as a plant is photosynthesizing, it's going to be using the glucose as a source of energy um, to uh, grow new cells, using the glucose to create other biological molecules that it needs for these new cells, such as uh, proteins and complex carbohydrates, um, lipids perhaps, um, and all of these will be used to increase its biomass and that's shown visually through its growth but you can record that more accurately by measuring the biomass so weighing your your seedlings after a certain uh, given amount of time to see how much they have increased in mass and you can attribute that directly to growth um, if you wanted to do a more direct measure, if you happen to have a CO2 probe or an oxygen probe just laying around, then you could measure the uptake of CO2. So how much uh, CO2 the plant is actually using in photosynthesis or measure the production of oxygen, which is obviously a byproduct of photosynthesis and is released by the plant. The other way that you could do if you don't happen to have either of these probes laying around and you wanted to do a direct method is to measure the volume of oxygen released by a plant. And um, that would give you an idea um, of how much or how, how quickly the rate of photosynthesis is happening, because if you varied something, the rate of oxygen production would reflect any change in the rate of photosynthesis. We can also um, count number of bubbles produced if we were using an aquatic plant like Elodea, which we talked about last time. Um, and that's the method that we use in school for your required practical. So we'll have a look at that now. So this diagram, it would be really helpful for you to have this in your book fully labelled because you may be asked about how to investigate the rate of photosynthesis in plants and you would need to be able to remember this particular practical and how it is carried out. So we tend to use boiling tubes and we put our pondweed into the boiling tubes with some pond water and also some sodium hydrogen carbonate in there. The reason we put that in is to make sure that the plant has a plentiful supply of carbon dioxide and that that doesn't then become a limiting factor which will slow down the rate of photosynthesis and make our results un, uh, invalid um, uh, because that would actually be an unfair test if we weren't controlling that particular factor. So we would then have a light source. And what you'll notice is we've got a tank in this diagram in between the lamp and the pondweed. And the reason that's there is because if you used a standard, standard filament bulb, you might know that they give off uh, quite a huge amount of heat energy. Uh, that thermal energy would raise the temperature of the water that the pondweed is sitting in and temperature um, because temperature increases in temperature will affect enzyme activity that would also affect the rate of photosynthesis and cause our results to again be invalid. Um, you could also use um, a lower energy bulb such as an LED because these do not give off um, huge amounts of thermal energy and that would be um, an appropriate measure to control the temperature in the water. You also need a ruler that will allow you to measure how far the pondweed is away from the light source because that's what we're going to be changing. The reason we change the distance is because as the pondweed is moved further away from the light source, the light intensity is reduced. And therefore, we can see if light intensity affects the rate of photosynthesis and how it affects the rate of photosynthesis. OK, 
So what I'd like you to do is draw that diagram and fully label it into your books as a point of reference, because as I said, you may be questioned on this and you may have to write a plan. And it's important that you remember the equipment that is used as well. And then draw a table that would be suitable to hold all of your data. Once you've done that, come back to the video and we will have a look at some results. Okay. So um, here is some example data. On the previous page, there was a link as well to an online practical where you can actually produce your own should you wish to do so. But here's some example data for you just in case you're not able to do that. So you've got the distance from the lamp to the beaker measured in centimetres, which is appropriate. We don't want to have it metres away and the number of bubbles given off per minute. So we're assuming in this case that all of the bubbles given off are the same size, the same volume. Um, it may not be the case, but this is an OK um, assumption for this particular practical. OK, so if you haven't generated your own data, jot this data down in the table that you put into your books. OK, and then um, come back to the video and we'll move on from here. OK, so this is um, an example of the virtual experiment that you can use on um, reading.ac.uk. Um, so you can actually do this and generate your own results. As I said, there's, um, there's example data on the page before. OK, and this is what your table should look like. So we're going to measure over one minute how many bubbles are released by our pondweed samples. And we're going to move um, 20 centimetres at a time. OK. All right, so what I would like you to do, and I do understand that you may not have any graph paper at home, what I'd like you to do is look at either the data you generated or the sample data and complete a sketch graph for me. So remembering what sketch graphs are, they don't necessarily have numbers along the axes, but they do have the titles, the headings that you need to have on your graph. So think about what needs to go on the X axis on the bottom and then what needs to go on the Y axis up the side, label it and then draw a line that would represent the data that you have in your table. It's just a sketch graph so no numbers are required. It's just to show a rough pattern of your data. When you've done that, task two is to analyze the pattern shown. So when we say analyze, what you're going to do is describe the shape of the line on your graph and then explain why you think the line is shaped like that. OK, so um, if you have initially a fast rate of photosynthesis and then it slows down, what do you think the cause of that would be? OK, when you've done that, come back to the video and we will move on. OK, so thinking about your analysis and your graph. So the graph on the left is what your sketch graph should roughly look like. OK, everybody's is going to be slightly different depending on what data they use and their interpretation. But as long as you've got um, an initial high rate of photosynthesis and as you move the pondweed away from the light source, that then slows down. So the slope levels out. That is absolutely fine. And that would show the expected results from this investigation. So what happens when we move the pondweed away from the source of light is the light intensity decreases. This is what you would expect. It actually decreases a lot faster than what you may think. And this is inverse square law. The reason we have to um, take into account the inverse square law is because as the light is traveling further before it reaches our sample of pondweed, it's also dispersing. So 
it's traveling to the pondweed, but as we get further away from the light source, the light becomes more dispersed. So we have an inverse relationship. So light intensity decreases as we move it away. Um, and we can see here, it is an inversely proportional relationship. So as we move away, you can see the light source there on the left hand side and you can see how much that light intensity decreases as you move away. So um, the light intensity is inversely proportional to the square of the distance to the source. So it's not just reducing um, in, a, in a linear way, it's inversely proportional to the square of the distance of the source, which is a much greater reduction than you what might first um, have thought, okay? Okay, so that's just a sketch graph there. So what we would see is initially as the pondweed is fairly close to the source of light that we have a high rate of photosynthesis. And then as the um, light intensity decreases as we move the pondweed further away, the rate of photosynthesis starts to drop and then level off. It doesn't stop, it just levels off. What this means is that light intensity is a limiting factor for photosynthesis because if you reduce the um, light intensity for a plant, it causes the rate of photosynthesis to drop, even if it's got everything else at the optimum level. OK, if it doesn't have enough light, it cannot keep increasing the rate of photosynthesis. So again, we have a similar shaped graph, but this one relates to carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is also a limiting factor for photosynthesis, because even if the temperature is optimum for the plant and it has plenty of light, if there is only a certain concentration of carbon dioxide and that's not increased, then the carbon dioxide will limit the amount of photosynthesis that can take place. Hence, it will not allow the rate of photosynthesis to increase beyond a certain level. This one is a different shape. And this one has links back to your work on enzymes earlier in the year, in year 10. So what we can see here is as we increase the temperature, that the plant is in, we get a rapid increase in the rate of photosynthesis. What we understand with enzymes is that with increasing temperature, enzyme activity is also increased because the particles that the enzymes themselves and the reactants that they catalyze are more likely to collide with enough energy to make that a successful collision and um, catalyze the reaction. However, what we also know about enzymes is if there is too much thermal energy, they move too fast and the vibrations from the thermal energy cause bonds in the 3D molecule, the enzyme itself, to break, causing it to change shape, to denature, and then it is no longer able to catalyze the reactants because they cannot fit into the active site. So temperature will increase the rate of reaction quite rapidly but there becomes a certain point where the enzymes are denatured and no longer work so that will reduce the rate of photosynthesis and it will eventually stop because the enzymes responsible for catalyzing the reaction will no longer function okay so we've got all three factors here on um, on the graph so we can see that light intensity has a big impact light and heat even more light heat and carbon dioxide together um, if you increase them and then obviously uh, up until a certain point that will increase the rate of photosynthesis but all of them will level off at some point because they are limiting factors okay that's just another way to 
to show the limiting factors on the graph. Okay, so um, I will be uploading another lesson shortly. I hope that's been helpful. As always, you can um, ask your teachers when we return in September for any more help that you might need for limiting factors for photosynthesis. Do go online and look for um, AQA required practicals. There are a huge number of videos online um, to revise those and lots of resources where you can do a virtual practical as well or see someone walking through a virtual practical. Um, I hope that's helped. Take care of yourselves. See you in September.